praise is rising. Have you ever heard things are not what they seem? Biblical hope is rooted in what we do not see. We are learning how to hope together and we want our living to be based on the great prayer of Apostle Paul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit as written in Romans 15, 13. Notice Paul does not say May your circumstances fill you with hope. Things may not look hopeful, but things are not always what they seem. Some people wait for their circumstances to bring them hope. Other people bring hope into their circumstances. Of course, a pandemic like this can be a hope killer. So many people lost their jobs. Other people lost their home. Your financial health may be threatened as you are alone and afraid. You may be filled with resentment. You may be burned out, stressed out, demotivated, discouraged. You may wonder, how do I have hope back? I'm so glad you tuned in for this message. 
we are going to look at the man in the Bible named Elijah, who suffered a colossal collapse of hope. Out of that collapse, which was remarkably sudden and incredibly deep, new hope was reborn for him. And so it can be for you and for us, for me. But before we look at this story, I want to say a few word about how to read and study the Bible stories. Contrary to a lot of popular perception, Bible stories are not like Aesop fables. Their purpose is not to get illustrations of virtues and principles. The hero of the Bible is God. And the Bible stories show us how God interacts with real, with flawed, with always morally ambiguous human beings like you and me. We are to learn there how to live life with God, how God revealed himself. And this is so true of our story. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Kings 18, you will discover that Elijah is a prophet of God, but he's a normal human being. But in this chapter, 1 Kings 18, Elijah is seriously overachieving. I'm sure you know the story. He courageously confronts 450 idolatrous prophets of Baal single-handedly. He builds the altar with stones. He digs the trenches. He holds the wood for the sacrifice. He butchers the bull. He prays for fire to come down from heaven. And then he defeats the prophets of Baal at the great risk to his own life. And when, under his inspiring preaching, multitudes of previously resistant Israelites fall to the ground and worship the one true God, Elijah tells the wicked king Ahab that now there will be an end to the three-year-old drought. Elijah then climbs from the bottom of the Kishon Valley back to the top of Mount Carmel again, and there he prays for rain. And when he is sure the rain is coming, then he tells the king to ride in his chariot to Jezreel, which is about 15 miles away, and the king obeys him and does it. We are told that Elijah had a burst of amazing energy, and he tucks his cloak into his belt, and Elijah runs ahead of Ahab, all the way to Jezreel, 15 miles. Imagine this guy outran a horse and a chariot. This guy cannot be stopped. He's like a Spider-Man, Captain America, Black Panther, and Wonder Woman all merged into one. And then we pick up the story in chapter 19. The wicked King Ahab tells his wife, Jezebel, what Elijah did about his amazing triumph, but she's not impressed. And so she sends a messenger to Elijah. We read in verse 2, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, the 450 dead prophets of Baal. Now when you read that Jezebel says, May the gods deal with me in this way, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life as life of one of those dead prophets, you know that we can expect an amazing confrontation. But somehow he cannot process this right. When she says, if by this time tomorrow I don't take your life, She's using what is called a threat formula. It's not supposed to be understood literally. If she meant this literally, she would have sent a group of soldiers to arrest him on the spot and bring him into the palace. But she didn't do that. She just realizes that Elijah is now a national hero. She knows it. And that's why she uses intimidating language against him. It's like, if you keep doing this, you will hear from my lawyers kind of thing. But you and I know that Elijah knows the power of God. He's the guy who called the fire down from heaven. He prayed away drought, outruns chariots. God feeds him by the ravens. He multiplies the food of the widow. He raises the, her dead son. 
this man can make kings and break kings. And so if you and I were standing there and Elijah was threatened by Jezebel like this, we would say, Jezebel, you sadly underestimate Elijah if you think that you can intimidate him with your punny little threats. Right, Elijah? Uh, where is Elijah? Has anyone seen Elijah? Because nobody has. We read in verse 3, Elijah ran for his life. And you and I already know that he's a pretty fast runner. And so he runs 125 miles south until he hits the southern border, the town of Beersheba. This is where you leave Israel, kind of like when you get to Dover, if you want to go to the continent and leave the United Kingdom. Elijah leaves his servant there in order to immigrate into the wilderness. Dismissing his servant is a symbolic way of leaving his job. If he makes his stuff redundant, he is leaving his ministry. He's crossing the border, and that is a symbol of leaving the people of God behind, the people that he was called to serve. And so he gets 125 miles south, all the length of Israel down south to Negev Desert, no man's land. And there in verse 4, we read, he came to a broom tree, sat down, and prayed, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And when you read this in chapter 19, you wonder, how could the triumphant, death-defying superhero Elijah of chapter 18 turn into this whiny, hopeless cry baby in chapter 19? And probably as contemporary people, the first things that hits you, maybe he was bipolar. If he were to go to a modern-day psychiatrist clinic and get examined, we'd look for manic signs in chapter 18. Risky behavior? Yes, he confronts the whole nation and the king and 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Astarta. Check, it's there. Excess energy? Yeah. He builds the altar, digs the trench, butchers the bull. He goes down to the Kishon Valley. Then he walks back to the top of Mount Carmel. Check. He outruns the chariot. Is he confrontational? Yes, he confronts the whole nation. How long are you going to behave like this? Does he have a seduced, reduced sense of fear? Yes, check. And then in chapter 19, we can look for diagnostic criteria of depression. Diminished interest in activity? Yeah, he doesn't want to do anything else. Fatigue and a loss of energy? That's correct, check it out. Depressed feeling of worthlessness and thoughts of suicide? I am not any better, take my life, check, it's there. Change in appetite, yes. Change in sleeping habits, yes, it's all there. He fulfills all criteria. Now, of course, thousand years ago, psychiatrist diagnostic categories did not exist. So I do not want to read them into the story. I just thought I would mention it because maybe you or somebody you love suffers from bipolar disorder or clinical levels of anxiety, or depression, or obsessive compulsive disorder, or dissociate disorder, or autism, or addiction, or some kind of mental health challenge. And you might be prone to think that God could never use you. Sometimes we sing in the famous hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus in the second stanza, we should never be discouraged. That's just not true. Elijah is discouraged. The idea that God cannot use you if you have some mental health challenges is just a lie from the hell. You see, the Bible is not a book of examples of moral virtue or mental or emotional health. It's a book about God and these strange ways how God works with the strangest of people. And so I want to say to you today, if you find yourself with some mental health challenges, if you have suicidal thoughts, you are not alone. You do not need to live in shame, 
you can reach out for help confidentially. We want to help you. Talk to someone today. We would love to be there for you. We really would. God doesn't want you to be in despair. He has a purpose for you and for your life, just as he did for Elijah. And so let us look at what killed the hope for Elijah in chapter 19. What choked his sense of worth and that there is a future for him. And then let's see how God as a skillful therapist helped him to get through it. Because that can help us. That can help us as we learn how to be apprentices of hope in this season of pandemic. You see, none of us have arrived. We are all just apprentices of hope. So the first thing that killed the hope for Elijah was just fatigue. Now, I know it may not sound terribly spiritual for you, but fatigue is a hope killer. When you think about what Elijah accomplished in chapter 18, now remember, he's a normal guy. After confronting the whole nation of Israel in one of the boldest speeches in all of the Bible, after taking single-handedly on 450 false idolatrous prophets, constructing the altar, butchering the bull himself, praying down fire from heaven, lecturing the wicked king, coming down to Kishon Valley, climbing back to the Mount Carmel again to pray for rain, and then outrunning a horse and a chariot for 15 miles, it's obvious this guy needed a break. His adrenaline levels must have been off the charts. He's not a superman. He is just a normal guy. Now, can I say this? You are just a normal guy. You are just a normal woman. You are just a normal man. You are an ordinary person. And one of the most amazing things in this story is that when Elijah pours out his surprising prayer, Lord, I had enough. I am no good. Take my life. God does not even bother to answer that because he knows this guy is just flat tired. Look at what, the, what God does for him in verse 5. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And so he ate, he drank, and he had another nap. And then the angel gave him another cake. So remember, when Elijah says, God, I am so mad, I want to die, God answers, have some food. Why don't you have a nap? And so Elijah slept and ate and then decided to run more. The lesson from the story is never underestimate the spiritual power of a nap and good food. For things are not always what they seem. Elijah is just plain tired. Do you ever get tired? You see, it's amazing. A few months ago, most of us never heard of Zoom. And now, some of the hottest topics going on is the Zoom fatigue. There is an article in Harvard Business Review, in National Geographic, and BBC. It turns out that when you stare at another person minute by minute, hour by hour, it's something we are not used to. Plus, you have to look at your own self in a box, and it turns out, turns out that your own self is a lot more wrinkled and looks much worse than you would have thought, and you get exhausted just by looking, sitting in a chair and looking at the screen. Now, I understand Elijah is not you. He doesn't have your stamina, your drive, your capability to thrive on junk for food and go without regular sleep or stay up long at night watching whatever. Elijah is world-changing, king-challenging, nation-forming, history-altering prophet. 
It's not in the same league as you are. I get that. But remember, you will never reach consistent spiritual renewal in a state of perpetual physical exhaustion. Let me say that again. You will never reach consistent spiritual renewal in a state of perpetual spiritual exhaustion. You inhabit your body and you live at the mercy of your body. And that's why this season, it's a good time not to complain what you can't do. I can't drive, I can't commute, I can travel abroad, I cannot get travel abroad, I cannot shop as I used to in a mall, I cannot eat out, I cannot go there, here or there, to a gym, to a swimming pool. Well, you know what can you do? You can rest, you can sleep, you can eat healthily. You can cut down on caffeine or anything detrimental that she's getting in the way for you. You can take long walks. You can meet with a friend. Maybe you can talk to your friend Jesus. Notice this. Sometimes the difference between the confident hope of Elijah in chapter 18 and the defeated spirit of Elijah in chapter 19 is just a good night sleep. Based on this story in the Bible, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to take a nap. Maybe that's why you tuned in today, so that you learn that fatigue is a number one hope killer. But there are some others. The next one is isolation. In verse nine, when God finally speaks to Elijah and responds to him after some time and the nap and the snack thing and another run of 200 more miles, God asks Elijah in verse 19, what are you doing here, Elijah? And in the Hebrew text, it's very clear that the emphasis is on the word here. What are you doing here? It's a question of physical location. Your calling is up there north, 325 miles, 520 kilometers. That's where your mission is. Your mission is there. What are you doing here? How did you end up here? And it's also a question about the spiritual condition. How did the once confident, faith-filled prophet of God became this despairing, hopeless, suicidal runaway? How did I get here? God knows that every one of us asks this question at some point in our lives. We all end up sitting under a broom tree like Elijah. We all end up in a desert asking, how did I get here? And notice the response of Elijah. In verse 10, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Notice, I have been very zealous. I tried my best, and now I am the only one left. They are all trying to kill me. Look how I am being treated. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. You see, I am no good. I would be better off dead. I don't know about you, but one of the things I am discovering, particularly at this season, and maybe also at this stage of my life, is the enormous capacity for self-pity that I have. It's almost a spiritual gift to feel sorry for what I am going through. Somebody re recently called self-pity a cold comfort. There is comfort in it, otherwise we wouldn't do it, but it's cold because it breeds isolation. It distorts our perspective and makes life look more hopeless. It's fascinating that chapter 18, his experience on the Mount Carmel, starts with a small story where Elijah is meeting Obadiah, the chief of staff of King Ahab, who makes him aware that there are at least 100 other faithful prophets who love God and serve God, and Obadiah is taking care of them, and their lives are at risk as well. 
But he hears about this. Obadiah tells him. Now one chapter later, in chapter 19, he forgets all about them and he says, Lord, I am alone. I'm the only one. And God responds so graciously in verse 11. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And Elijah then is given one of the most amazing, tangible manifestations of the presence of God and the glory of God in the Old Testament, where he sees a mighty wind and a great earthquake and a powerful fire. It's called Theophany, the revelation of God. There and comes after the wind and earthquake and a powerful fire, a phrase which is so difficult to translate in the words of King James Version, a still small voice. But probably a better translation would be a gentle breeze, gentle breeze, or as a NISB puts it, a voice of sheer silence. What voice does silence have? And then God asks him exactly the same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 13. And you and I wait to see how Elijah would be changed, how he would have been changed, moved and challenged and inspired and encouraged by witnessing this amazing actual presence of God. How different will he be his response from verse 10? How he will be transformed by having seen this amazing revelation of God's glory. So notice what he says in verse 14. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put down your prophets to death with a sword. Now I'm the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. You know what's astounding? He hasn't changed at all. It's precisely the same speech, word by word, as he gave in verse 10. You can be sure he has rehearsed this in his head during his 325-mile journey so often and so well that now he can repeat it word by word without thinking about it. All this powerful spiritual experience, this manifestation of God, was utterly wasted on this man. But here's the good news. God is not finished with him. God is not done with us, even though all the powerful sermons and manifestations that he gave us and the experience, spiritual experiences that we had were more or less wasted on us. God tells Elijah that there are thousands of others who are ready to stand with him. He says, Elijah, I have 7,000 other people. You are a part of a much larger community. You know, things are not the way they seem. You can still inspire and encourage other people, Elijah. There are other people who can model hope for you. And then he says, go all the way back and anoint another man, another king, Find a man named Elisha, who is going to become your student, who is going to become your partner, who is more than that going to become your friend, and who is ultimately going to become like a son to you. Because Elisha, actually, when Elijah is taken away from him, says, Elijah, my father, Elijah, you are not alone. Your enemy is not so strong. Israel is not so faithless. God is not so distant as it seems to you. Things are not always the way they seem. The story teaches us that hope is not a solo activity. Hope is a team sport. Isolation diminishes hope. Connection multiplies hope. One of the amazing things of the current situation is that because of Zoom, you can be connected with a friend who lives 3,000 miles away. And that's why everybody in our church, everybody needs to have a support group. Every time Elisha would look at 
Elijah would look at Elisha, it would remind him, God's work is going to continue. It will go on. Your efforts are not in vain. There is hope. One of the spiritual practices is to talk about what you hope for with someone else. What do you hope for as a wife, as a husband? What do you hope for as a dad or as a mom? What do you hope for as a leader? What are your spiritual hopes? What are your financial hopes? What are your vocational hopes? Try to share your hopes with someone else this week. Tell people what you are hoping for. What are your hopes for in this season? Because by breaking out of our isolation, we help each other to keep the hope alive. Now, what is killing your hope? Fatigue does, sure. Isolation does, sure. And the last one is worry. Now, as we think about it, it's really hard to worry and be hopeful at the same time. Actually, the trigger for the loss of hope in the story for Elijah was that he was afraid. He ran away from his life. But I have a good news and bad news for you. The good news is that hope can exist right alongside of worry. The bad news is that hope only exists alongside of worry. Sometimes people think that you can use religion, that you can use hope to get rid of worry, to avoid worry, to escape from worrying at all so that you will have a nice little life worry-free, pleasant, beautiful life. Actually, it works exactly the other way. Louis Smith, a psychologist and theologian who was a professor at Fuller Seminary, he, wrote, he writes uh, about a study how during the World War II, American airmen coped with fear. Many, were over, many of them overcame fear by giving up on hope. They simply believe that one of these times that they were flying on a mission, they are going to get killed. They are going to get die. They are going to die. And because they gave up on hope that they will survive, they no longer lived in fear. They just resigned themselves to the fact that they might die on one of these missions. But then a strange thing happened. When they had only a few missions left before going on a furlough, when they were almost at the finish line, they started to believe that they might actually survive. And suddenly they cared whether they survive or not. They started to hope. But when they started to hope again, they started worrying again. Biblical hope is not fatalism. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. We only hope for what we do not have. That means that hope and worry are actually siblings. Famous French writer Jacques, Jacques Ellul wrote, the person who is plunged into doubt is not the unbeliever, but the person who has no other hope but hope. Believers struggle with doubt precisely because we live by faith. That means as long as we live by faith and hope, we will know doubt and fear. As long as you have something to be hope for, to hope for, you will have something to worry about. Isn't that great news? But that's okay. It's okay because we live in a real world and our hope is not in hope, our hope is in God. Our hope is not in we be, that we are strong and hopeful people. Our hope is that our God is strong and good God. In verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. God is saying to Elijah, I hope you had a nice trip. I hope you enjoy your nap and that the snack was good. I hope you enjoyed the show up on the mountain. But now go back the way you came. Your mission is there. And he gives Elijah a new assignment. He gives him leaders to anoint, judgments to pronounce, colleagues to recognize. I have a job for you. I am not finished with you. And you know what's so frustrating about this story? 
the writer tells us absolutely nothing how Elijah felt about this. Earlier, we got so much about his fear, his escape, his aloneness, his feelings of failure, his self-pity, his desire to die, his feelings that he was the only one that was faithful to God. Then God gives him rest and food and quiet and more than a month of furlough and recovery and a divine revelation by showing his glory and then asks him some probing questions and then he shows him a new direction. I still count on you, Elijah. I have a task for you to do. How did Elijah feel about that? Was he all charged up? Was he confident? Was he hopeful? Or was he still afraid? And the frustrating thing is the text does not say so. All that we know is that Elijah did what God asked him to do. Now, can I tell you my guess? My guess is that for the remainder of his life, Elijah had to deal with both of them. He had to choose hope and manage fear. He had to choose hope and manage his fears. But he obeyed God. He did go back down the mountain, away from the wilderness, and took courageous action that God asked him to take. He said, I guess you do not want me to retire here in the desert where things will be nice and quiet. I guess I just won't withdraw up the mountain and make my life manageable. I guess you want me to do something. You know, it's much easier to act your way into feelings than to feel your way into actions. When you act like a hopeful, courageous, expectant person, pretty soon you will start feeling hopeful, courageous, and expecting great things to happen. If you just stay up on the mountain and wait for the feelings to strike you before you decide to leave, you will never leave. So, God says to Elijah, I have a job for you. So tell me, what are you going to do today? Are there any great hopes in you? Would you pray a bold prayer? Would you give something to somebody? Would you take an initiative to reach out to some of your friends? Will you decide to start learning a new skill? Would you commit to volunteer in some helpful way? Are you willing to cheer up, cheer on a co-worker? Would you confess to God or ask somebody for help? Would you change what needs to change? Do it. Stop waiting until you feel hopeful and start acting in, help, in hope. For life is not an empty dream and things are not what they seem. And if you are not sure what to do, then just have a nap, eat some good food, and come back next week to London Live. Amen. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for the stories of old that teach us how to live today. We thank you that you understand that sometimes we can get discouraged, that we feel down. Forgive us that so easily we forget that we live at the mercy of our body, that we feel so isolated and do not see the value of the community that you put around us, and that we feel that our worry cannot exist alongside hope. And so we thank you this day for a new assurance that you are always there with us. You are not disgusted with us and you don't feel that what you did for us was wasted that you always have a job, you always have a mission for each one of us. And for that, we are eternally thankful to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you, everybody.
you enjoyed our worship today and I would at this point love to encourage you to be faithful to God um, to return your tithes offering and also to contribute to our hardship fund the details are actually on your screen right here right now but uh, please make sure that you put in the reference uh, why and specifically where you are sending your money into um, obviously, um, you will have to do this online. Uh, wherever you go to the, your online banking, uh, please use the details on the screen to do so. And uh, as uh, the Bible says, test God and see how faithful he is back to you. Uh, as we are finishing now, I would like to encourage you and invite you to join us on um, our Zoom session right as we finish. Um, it's basically just for us to get together, to chat, to, to, to talk to you, to get to know you um, and um, just simply to have a good time. The details are again on the screen. Um, I will also recite the number for you. It's 255-255-2001. You have to, um, however, message or um, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook or uh, whatever you use to contact any of us here uh, you need to message us so that we can give you the password for security purposes so 255-255-2001 uh, we look forward to 
seeing you in the Zoom session a little bit later. But in the meantime, um, I hope you have a great week and see you again next week at five. Bye-bye.